Well, hi everyone, welcome. Welcome to the first session of this seminar series regarding climate disinformation. Today with Jenny King and Alexandra Gies. My name is Katarina Klapek. And I would like to mention one thing. This meeting is being recorded. There will be a recording of this event on YouTube. After the presentations, there will be a short Q&A session. You will be able to ask questions. If you want to do so anonymously, you can do this in the chat. If you prefer asking your question with your name and with your camera on, we would like you to use the Q&A function and to put a little asterisk there so we know. My name is Katarina Klapek. I will be the moderator of today's session. I would like to briefly introduce myself optically for blind people. I am a white person. I have short brown hair. I am non-binary and I have a strong makeup on with a red lipstick and black eyeliner. I'm a speaker for feminist policies at the Heinrich Böll Stiftung and together with my colleagues Zora Siebert and Ferran Maya, I was able to plan this wonderful event today. In today's event, there will be simultaneous interpretation and closed captions. If you would like to hear interpretation into English, please select the globe. For hearing impaired and deaf people, we have transcription as well. You should be able to see this over my head um, where you can see who can see this transcription. You can click there and select your preferences. So after this brief technical introduction, let's get started. First, I would like to speak about the schedule of today's webinar. First, I'm going to introduce my today's speakers, Jenny King and Alexandra Gies. Then there will be short presentations of both participants so of Jenny King and Alexandra Gies. And afterwards, you are welcome to ask any questions. We are looking forward to that. Let's start on time and end on time today. But if you have any questions, you can always contact us via our email address. That's my email address, actually, um, to ask questions or voice other remarks. So let's now get started with our first speaker. Jenny King is the head of the Institute for Strategic Dialogue for Climate Research and Policy. She has worked on the paper Climate Lockdown and the Culture of Wars on COVID-19 sparked a new narrative against climate action. She also founded the group Climate Action at the Institute for Strategic Dialogues. She's also an author. She's written for the BBC, The Guardian, The New York Times and The Washington Post, amongst others. And it is my pleasure to hand over here to Jenny. Jenny, the stage is yours. Thank you very much for having me today. Um, I'm just going to, I think I'm on the right interpretation track. So I. I'm going to spend the next 10 to 15 minutes or so taking you through how the threat around climate change has shifted in terms of the information that is circulating in the public sphere and how that means people understand and can navigate this really complicated topic. And above all, what that means about the potential of pursuing the kinds of necessary, ambitious climate agendas that are needed to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. Obviously, this is at the forefront of everybody's mind because the COP28 summit is going to start next week in the UAE. And so this is an absolutely critical time for climate policy. But it's also a time where 
conversations around climate change are really at the forefront of public life. You're going to see uh, uh, exponentially more media reporting, public debates, and general engagement with the conversation around mitigation and adaptation than you would at any other time of year. And this means that it's a particularly um, important time to understand what some of the vulnerabilities are that exist in both the digital space and offline. So where I'd like to start is thinking about mis- and disinformation in terms of a marketplace of ideas and coming back to that old economic theory around supply and demand. And I think quite often we only focus on the supply side. So who are the bad actors that are spreading falsehoods or you know, trying to mislead the public around some of these key public policy areas? But it's also absolutely essential to think about the demand side of misinformation, which means why is it that this kind of content has such disproportionate impact on public life and why it feels like it's taking up so much more oxygen in the public space than it did five years ago or even you know three years ago and part of the reason why that is the case is because we are living in a moment of intersecting crises and this creates the perfect soil for mis and disinformation both to spread through our information environments and also for it to emotionally resonate with people and for them to actually go out and seek the kinds of information that confirm all of their biases preconceptions and assumptions about the world, rather than seeking kind of fact-based content that might be counter to the kind of belief system that they have about how society works. So COVID-19 was of course a, a kind of turbocharging moment where all sorts of new communities formed in the online space and people were desperately seeking information about a rapidly evolving situation. But what's happened in the aftermath of the pandemic is that a lot of those communities have now been weaponized or actively exploited by bad actors who have seen this diverse audience that is, you know, very concerned about um, about the state of the world and that they've managed to pivot people away from thinking about public health into some of these other controversial public policy areas of which climate is is at the forefront. In the aftermath of the pandemic, we also have a number of these really pronounced economic and social and political shocks happening across Europe and around the world, including spiraling cost of living and the fact that many countries are sort of teetering on the edge of a potential economic recession. Then we had Russia's full scale invasion of Ukraine and what that's done in terms of sending shocks through the energy supply chain at an international level and also in shifting a lot of the geopolitical alliances that existed in Europe and beyond. And then we have sitting underneath all of this, some of these generational challenges that fundamentally change the way that people view the world, the way that they see governments and them and and the interaction between institutions and people, including the erosion of trust in politics, in the media, and in science, and the massive and growing gap that exists between the haves and the have-nots in most societies around the world. So, you know, the emergence of a very obvious billionaire class that is seen as kind of sitting separate to the 99% that are not experiencing the, the benefits of so-called growth and progress in a number of ways, and who feel that really acutely in their day-to-day -day lives. Of course, since I you know, originally made this slide, we also have a new emerging conflict in the Middle East and the you know, enormous impact that that is having on, on global conversations. So all of these factors together create, as I said, in some ways, the perfect conditions for people not only to be vulnerable to mis- and disinformation, but almost for them to seek content that is driven by some of these ideological divides, because it is a moment of, you know, acute polarization, of fear, of grievance, and where people are experiencing real instability in their own everyday lives that impact the way that they choose to consume information. So I think that's a good starting point for what, what has shifted and why we're at such a, a uniquely problematic moment. Then we come to the question of supply. And obviously the supply is you know, arguably a bigger problem than demand, which is that people might want um, clickbaity style conversations or you know, they might be seduced by most um, 
polarizing and, and incendiary ways of framing issues. But if there are people producing that content, then you don't have an ecosystem for mis and disinformation. So who are the actors that are currently operating in this space and what do they stand to gain by spreading this type of content? And when people talk about, about climate change, I think that they are still have quite a narrow conception that is only thinking about industry actors. So, you know, big oil and gas companies or the big auto industry or, you know, the agricultural lobby and the fact that they are investing billions of dollars on an annual basis to do forms of public influence campaigning around the globe both through traditional advertising and PR, but also using now the opportunities of social media to try and engage new audiences and new demographics and provide a continued social license for the use of fossil fuels. So for example, you have seen um, oil and gas companies engaging with uh, celebrity chefs on TikTok or beauty bloggers on Instagram, or even gamers on platforms like Discord and Twitch to subtly promote the use of gas stoves, the use of diesel petrol in cars, you know, um, other forms of greenwashing. And that part of that is about trying to communicate with a younger and supposedly more progressive audience who may well be very supportive of climate action and to try and convince them that they are, you know, good faith actors in this space and that they are champions of climate action. So, you know, this, this group, this industry lobby, they are very vested in maintaining the carbon economy and they are quite disciplined in the tactical and the messaging playbook that they use. They have been honing those playbooks since the 1970s. And as I said, they have very deep pockets at their disposal to fund this kind of activity at a global level. But they are by no means the only game in town. And I think we miss some of the bigger picture at the moment if we only think about Shell or Total or Saudi Aramco as the bad actors in this space. You know, I believe that many of the people on the call today are, are, are based in Germany and hostile state interference is incredibly relevant to the German information environment at the moment, in particular, information warfare that is being led by pro-Kremlin propaganda networks. We are about to bring out a report in advance of COP next week. And one of our core findings is the way that Russian state media, Russian diplomats, and their wider universe of amplifiers and, and promoters, the way that they use certain issues to try and drive division in, um, in certain societies. And Germany is at the forefront of that battleground. So it's not just about trying to maintain reliance on Russian oil and gas, but it's also about the way that climate can be used to, tr to drive a wedge between citizens and elected officials and to try and create the, impre the impression that net zero is an elitist agenda, that it's a pretext for state tyranny, that it's being used to you know, keep people in a, in a position of servitude and dependence, that it's trying to strip people of their civil liberties, and that that serves their foreign policy goals and their broader geopolitical goals, which are ultimately to seed chaos and to weaken support for liberal democracies. So, you know, they are also an increasingly relevant actor in this space. And then you have the third ecosystem, which is one that I'm sure you'll all have come across in your everyday lives. And that is the attention economy, or sometimes referred to as the outrage economy online. And these are the kind of actors who they may or may not be interested in climate change. They may or may not have a consistent position on net zero policies, but their main goal is to try and generate profit from the outputs that they produce on social media and other digital platforms. And more often than not, the way that they do that is by spreading mis- and disinformation, so-called controversial content. Often it is badged as being anti-woke content or sort of positioning itself in opposition to mainstream public opinion. And that they are absolutely weaponizing the current architecture of social media in order to do that, because they know, and I'll come to this in a later slide, that that kind of content gets the most likes, it gets the most clicks, it gets the most comments, and as a result, it is being constantly recommended to users in order to keep them online and keep them browsing. And this is a very complicated ecosystem because it doesn't have very consistent messaging. It is basically throwing a new conspiracy at the wall every week or a new line of attack 
or a new you know, form of abuse and harassment against figureheads at the wall. And it's seeing what sticks with their audience, what gains traction, what seems to whip people up into a frenzy, what, you know, preys on people's emotions in, the, in a way that means they engage with this content. And, and all of these different actor groups, the fossil fuel lobby, hostile states, and the outrage merchants are all existing in the same online environment. So if you are an average member of the public and you are trying to understand the realities of climate change and the viable pathways forward, you have this unbelievably complex and muddied landscape that you are trying to wade through in order to find credible and verified information. What do we mean when we're, when we're talking about mis- and disinformation? Is it only the, the rejection of climate change as a phenomenon or claiming that fossil fuels are not, are not part of the problem? That is certainly one aspect. But again, that's only what I would call the sharp tip of the spear. So that's the most extreme form of misinformation. But actually, the content that tends to gain the most traction and that is most popular both online and in some legacy media is this second tier. Content that is deliberately misrepresenting scientific data that is trying to undermine trust in institutions, whether it's the European Union or the United Nations or the, uh, the IPCC, um, or if it's specific ministries that are working on climate policy, if it's academic bodies that are at the forefront of producing climate modeling and climate science, and that generally frames climate change through this conspiratorial lens. So it may acknowledge begrudgingly that climate change exists, but it is still drawing the conclusion that we don't need action on climate change or that all of the solutions currently on the table are not going to work, that they're overly expensive, that they are overly destructive to society. And then finally, you also have this third tier of content, which many people might understand via the, the word greenwashing, which is presenting itself as being part of the solution. So, you know, you might have a company that says, we are absolutely committed to decarbonization and we believe in the principles of the Paris Agreement. And that is why we are investing in carbon capture and storage. Even though the scientific consensus says absolutely unequivocally that carbon and capture and storage cannot be the main solution going forward. And indeed that the technology does not exist at the scale and the sophistication needed to actually reduce emissions in the short term. So again, if you are a normal member of the public, you might see those adverts or, or that, uh, that reporting and think, oh, well, this is a good news story. Companies are trying to be part of the solution. But actually, it is a very conscious misrepresentation, both of their investments in achieving net zero and also in how viable those solutions are in moving forward. This is also a, a really helpful diagram, and, and I know Alexandra was keen to say something about discourses of delay. I'm not going to go into it in an in enormous amount of detail, but would thoroughly encourage everybody to, to view it in their own time. And I will share a comic book version of this diagram, which is a fantastic resource to share with anybody trying to understand this really complicated space. But these are some of the subtler arguments that have taken over denial because um, bad actors realized that going out in public and saying climate change doesn't exist no longer has the same kind of social license that it did in the early 2000s or even in, you know, 2010, 2011. Public opinion has thankfully shifted. And at least in Europe, most people do believe and understand the reality of climate change. They know that it is linked to human activity and they want their governments to take some form of action to solve the problem. However, there still remains a persistent and very critical gap between recognizing the problem and actually having the kinds of legislative and policy agendas that are needed for climate action. And it's in that gap between recognition and implementation that you see most information warfare taking place. And that's why these subtler arguments can be so powerful because they prey upon that confusion they prey upon the fact that climate change is a very technical and scientific topic. And they also um, use some of these 
you know, forms of emotional manipulation to convince people that this is the wrong time for action, that we can't afford it, that it's too difficult, um, that we've already missed the opportunity, that, you know, the window of, of time to act has already passed. And what it's aiming to produce is apathy so that we never actually move forward, that we come, become paralyzed in these debates to the extent that we never pursue renewable energies, we never think about the other solutions at the table, and we end up with the same end result, which is the status quo. I've already touched on this a little bit, but I just think it's worth re-emphasizing that the goal around climate mis and disinformation is no longer exclusively about delaying climate action, that there is also this wider objective at play, which is the way that climate change is seen as being symbolic of wider social fractures and divisions, and how that means that it's become a much more mainstream or normalized conversation. So, you know, um, when people are talking about something like uh, wind and solar energy, or 15 minute cities, or, or heat pumps, which I know have been a very controversial topic in Germany, they're not necessarily engaging at all with the substance of that debate. They're not worried about whether or not it's economically sound or, you know, what the actual rollout would look like. Instead, they're framing it through these much larger themes about power and individual freedoms and state overreach and control. And that that is being used to exploit these divisions, both that exist within countries, but also that exist within regions or at the global level. So, you know, pitting Germany against Poland or Germany against France or pitting Europe against the global south and saying net zero is a form of Western imperialism and, and um, it's reproducing um, colonial outcomes. And as a result, if you believe in human rights, you should oppose any moves to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to achieve net zero. So there are kind of both of these things sitting in tandem. And again, that makes the information environment really, really complicated. Where I'll end is with a little, um, a little interactive exercise for everybody on the call, which is, why is it that this content always seems to be recommended by platforms or, or being surfaced to users? Why does it seem when we log on to social media, regardless of if, of if it's X or Facebook or TikTok or YouTube or Telegram or vContact or Discord or Gab, why does it seem that mis- and disinformation seems to be occupying so much oxygen within, within those spaces? And I would like everybody in the, on the call to imagine that you are a social media algorithm. So your job as an algorithm is to make sure that users stay browsing as long as possible. You are optimizing for engagement and your ultimate metric of success is eyeballs. So how long do people stay doom scrolling, you know, going through their news feed and, uh, and staying glued to their screens? So you are looking for any content that seems to be keeping people online lo as long as possible. But at the same time, you know that your company and the bosses that control you have terms of service in place and have content moderation mechanism mechanisms in place, which mean that some content can't be shared or it can't be promoted. So, you know, you can't be promoting terrorist content. You can't be promoting active hate speech. And in some cases, you can't be promoting disinformation that could lead to real world harm. So you know that there's a line there that you're not allowed to cross and that you need to be a little bit careful in making sure that you don't give space and, and profile to the worst offending forms of content. So what you do is you recommend the stuff that lies just on the line of that content moderation. And that's where you find all of the worst offending incendiary content, clickbait, emotionally manipulative content, propaganda, which is quite hard to categorize neatly and for it to be tackled by content moderation, but is high traction, it is compelling, it is good at, um, at getting people's engagement, even if they hate it. So they might be sharing it in order to disagree with it, but they are nonetheless sharing it. So if you are an algorithm, you look at that content and you go, this is this is perfect. This is the exact type of thing that I want to be serving to my hundreds of millions or billions of users. And that's how you end up with these ecosystems that are not geared towards safety, that are not geared towards credible information coming from verified sources. But instead, you end up with these new gatekeepers, these new amplifiers that are controlling so much of public discourse 
but that seem to be grounded in the worst forms of, um, of mis and disinformation and other misleading tactics. I think I will end there and pass over to Alexandra, but I look forward to, to taking questions in the latter half of the session. No, no, thanks, Alexandra. Of course, you're welcome. But first, I want to introduce you just very shortly. Jenny, they ask us whether people can have the presentation later, if you can send this, whether they can make it available. Yes, yes, she's nodding. Thanks for that. And I've got the big pleasure here to introduce Alexandra Geese, because you are MEP since 2019 and the digital expert of the Green uh, uh, Group. You also work cooperated in the Digital Service Act. You negotiated in it. And since 2022, you're the vice president of the group. And your focal areas are democracy in the digital area and sustainable digitization. And of course, my personal highlight, gender equality. And you're also member of the budget commission and also for the internal market and uh, consumer protection. And it's a big pleasure having you here. And it's a pleasure to hand over to you right now. Thank you, Katerina, for these introductory words. It was worthwhile listening to them. And hello, first of all, to all our listeners who listened to Jenny before, who's one of our, my favorite speakers. When it comes about this uh, topic, I would like to um, frame it more against the backdrop of the German context, uh, context and then go to the uh, social networks. And Jenny also said, it's not, they're not just, this denial of climate this harsh, but also the climate delay discourses, which we most see in Germany. So this statement, the man-made climate change doesn't exist. This uh, hardly exists anymore in Germany, at least it's not the majority, but what we do see a lot in Germany and which is getting stronger and stronger are these climate delay discourses starting with this classic and not in my backyard. Yes, of course you have to do climate action, but please somewhere else. Not in my backyard, not in Germany, because we've got a strong industry and we cannot destroy it. And even very serious people think this way. And often an argument then is China, they're still building coal plants and they have these big populations. And we are only responsible for 2% of the CO2 emissions, but then they don't think we are just 1% of the population worldwide and historically have contributed a lot. And of course, yes, China is still building coal plant, but also they are intensively investing in the solar industry and in energy uh, transition. This is a very classical um, climate delay discourse. Another discourse you hear very often in Germany is this openness for technology. We can't hear it anymore. For example, e-fuels that do not really exist or not at affordable prices or in high volumes. But what we get, what really triggers a lot of discussions, the these discourses that work in Germany against uh, cars with uh, fuels. And then we see this um, base narrative that Jenny mentioned. So what is globally distributed, so climate change is an event, invention of global elites in order to disenfranch uh, people of their rights and take uh, their wealth and they declinate it in all forms. We've seen that a lot in the um, Heating Act, where we saw now there is the economic minister that wants to take away your central heating, and there will be a prohibition 
of heating from 2024. Everybody has to change their heating system. This is a typical narrative with a lot of news, with a lot of pictures uh, relying on this basic narrative. And they work that well because people are already prepared to believe in this very quickly. And then as Oxfam just saw that 1% of population has the biggest responsibility for the CO2 emissions and uh, originates this climate change. It's not the poorer people, the low income people, but they, they want to avoid that these are distributed equally the costs. And of course, the measure that can be done in that moment is always the wrong one for the Federal Republic and other things should be done instead. That's what people say. And we saw that especially with the Act on Heating, that's the big problem. And all of that uses this information. For example, the Act on Heating, not only completely broken heating systems need to be exchanged, but all. That's the image that has established, been established in people's heads. Even if that is not the case, it's very hard to reach people with the truth. But why does it work so well? These things are completely untrue. Why do they work so well? Why are they so convincing? And why do they stick so well with people? They don't leave people with facts, but with an essential outlook and the feeling that climate protection is problematic. Jenny has teased this already. These things are doing very well on social media. Many of us are not really in the target group and we don't really see this happening, but most people see that regularly, daily in their timelines. And if they click on it, they see it even more often. So they see contents with exactly those messages. Climate protection endangers you. People who want to um, implement climate protective measures want to take your house away, your car away. You've worked for this and now some young people are coming, the global elite, some educated folk, and they want to take your rights away. It works because it makes people scared and fear works in social media to keep people scrolling on the internet because contents which um, make people feel angry or scared are clicked on more often. People write comments more often. The algorithm sees that. So the algorithm says, right, contents with a lot of interaction so that are shared lots that uh, get a lot of comments. They get pushed to the very top. And if they're at the very top, they're going to be seen by many people. So facts posted by the ministry are seen by 100 or 1000 people in the internet. But the meme that suggests something completely different and scares people is seen by millions of people. That's called engagement based ranking and it's really dangerous for the spread of disinformation, but also for the spread on distribution of hate against acting actors, politicians. It's a huge issue in Germany. By the way, it really affects green politicians, voluntary politicians, politicians on a local level, and it affects women disproportionately. This dis disinformation and this type of hate and agitation is used because it makes people interact. So it's in that paradox. That's the diagram Jenny showed earlier that I'm referring to, that one line goes up and many more people see that type of content in comparison to any other type of content, which is why it's so dangerous. There's another mechanism which makes this worse, which is the mechanism of targeting, personalization. That relates to these groups, Meta, Google, TikTok. They have immense data about us, so they know precisely what our interests are and what makes us angry. They know what our limits are as well. So we get the contents that we think are plausible, that somehow fit our worldview, but that might make it a little more extreme. And the more you click on it, the more contents that become more and more extreme you get. It's a bit like with drugs. People start with a very low doses and then the doses has to be increased. That's how the internet works. Now targeting, groups know exactly where we are, what our interests are, what we would look at, what we would think is completely absurd. And then step by step, they can make our position more extreme. 
In addition to that, you get recommendation mechanisms. For example, autoplay on YouTube. They just make us watch things or recommendation mechanisms for certain groups of people. And there's proof that people consume more and more extremist, extremist contents because of that. And often these are contents that are hate contents agitation contents. So people might say it's an, it's just the internet. The internet doesn't have any impacts. It's down to the concrete politics and the communication in the media. That is not true. The internet is very strong now so that media and official politics are not sure of it. So in politics, the more toxic, the more extremist the message that's sent out, the more visible you are with that message. What do politicians need? What, what do groups need? They need that visibility. Otherwise, they simply can't reach people with their messages and they'll get bad um, results in the elections. So we're seeing parties using these messages again and again because it makes them visible, also in traditional media. This also means that the specter of parties is seeing a shift towards the right, not only in environmental aspects, but in many aspects. And that's very obvious right now because electors are bomb bombarded with these contents. And that's, of course, taken back to politicians and then politicians take these issues up. So political parties have to become more extreme to gain visibility. This could be seen since 2016 in the US, for example, if you followed that, what happened with the Republican Party there, well, that's what's going to happen in Germany as well. And climate protection is one of the three big narratives, which is why the debate surrounding climate protection is so extreme and so tense at the moment, because it's not actually down to facts anymore. It's down to emotions that are triggered or can be triggered and the visibility you can reach with using these messages on the internet. It's dangerous, it's a threat to democracy because from democracy research, we know that in strongly polarized societies where there's mo mo a lot of to toxic behavior, so hate, agitation, people and voters are more willing to question or to give up um, democratic principles to implement party interests. Now, you often hear the argument that the counteractive measures for this would be traditional media, traditional media reporting. Well, that's becoming more and more difficult as well because the media is becoming a part of the logic of these internet groups. So trends in social networks quickly swap over to traditional media. One example are journalists who are tweeting, they're using X. I don't actually want to speak on X specifically because it's promoting right wing extremist content, which is problematic. But the fact that journalists believe that social media would represent the average of the society, that's problematic, that belief. And they're also producing content for social media. Think of all the diagrams from the Bild newspaper in Germany regarding the act on heating or any brief clips from talk shows that are posted on YouTube, for instance. And one big problem is that the media is struggling with, finan with finances because um, the money they make um, is much less than what they make online. So what's made online goes to Google or Meta to 85%. So they have to produce contents which work well on social media to make money still. And when it comes to climate, it's not about reports that show what you can do um, to have a positive impact on, on the climate and what it can do for the German economy to be able to compete. Uh, it's all about disinformation. That's what's popular. So we really have to counteract this. We have to be very active. We have to understand the mechanisms. I think there are two other seminars in this seminar row or seminar series will speak about solutions then but a part of the solution will be to change the mechanisms in social media thank you thank you very much alexandra now we've got around 20 minutes after these two great inputs to address any questions and we do have quite a few questions in our q a I'm just going to go through them one by one. 
The first question goes to Jenny regarding the um, Emily in Paris slide and whether you could explain that. Yes, absolutely. I realized as I finished speaking that I probably should have explained that analogy. But the uh, the comparison is um, you know, Emily in Paris, for those uh, who may not have come across it, was a viral show on Netflix that was broadly sort of stereotyped as being very bad in terms of quality and that lots of people were hate watching it, which meant that nobody thought it was good and everyone was essentially engaging with it in order to be part of the cultural conversation and also to criticize it or to make fun of it or to, you know, engage in the memes and generally um, sort of contribute to that cultural moment. And that's sort of the equivalent of what is taking place with social media algorithms, is it's not necessarily the case that everyone engaging with this mis and disinformation believes it, but nonetheless, that it's very good at whipping up those kinds of controversies. So the, that's where the comparison comes in, is that even if people are sort of hate engaging with bad actor content, if you are the algorithm or if you are the platforms, what you see is the engagement. So you see the fact that people have quote tweeted something, or you see the fact that people have put an emoji response, or you see the, the fact that people have commented, and you're not necessarily adjusting for sentiment. You're not seeing whether the responses are positive or negative. All that you are doing is recognizing how many people seem to be flooding up into that space and that you therefore provide even more amplification and spotlight on that type of mis and disinformative content. Thank you very much, Jenny. Due to time constraints, I will try to summarize a few questions now. In the Q&A chat, we're seeing a lot on how to encounter climate disinformation. There was one question regarding Jenny's slides, and it was how to cope with the engagement circle, how to break it. But at the same time, our participants are also wondering whether we need more education. Can there be sufficient education to break these cycles? And the other question, of course, would be um, side education, if you like, and systematical work. So how can a person educate themselves or behave on social media in order to deal with climate disinformation? And that might be a question to Alexandra as well, um, who has specifically talked on the engagement on social media as an activist. Yes, I'd like to answer, what can we do to change the algorithms? I believe as individuals, uh, you can't do very much. It's on a political level, but the political level has done work. In Europe, we have seen the Digital Service Act in this legislation period. So it's called the Digital Services Act. I was actively involved in this as well, and we ensured uh, that there would be risk assessments of the platforms as to how their business models, how their algorithms could um, pose certain threats and parts of that are um, topics like public health, elections, so climate disinformation, public disinformation is one of the risks that have to be assessed in that regard. And on the basis of that assessment, the commission, the platform, uh, the platform has to say how they want to change that. And the European Commission, which implements the law for the large groups, can ask for this to be changed as well. So the commission could say engagement-based ranking, so the interaction-based ranking, which uh, shows that that bad contents are enforced much more than good ones. That's a threat to democracy. That needs to be changed. The Commission could say that. For that, you need a lot of political back backing for them to actually do that. But we finally have the legal basis for it. And that's the solution for me. So it's not about censoring contents. That's extremely dangerous. It's about changing the algorithms. And for that, we need legal basis and we need to um, explain it to top and leading politicians that they can use that. I think if you're looking at it from an individual level, you can't do much other than um, um, saying the truth, saying that it's not true, using emotions, using imaging um, or images, but that's quite a lot of work. You should do that if you are on social media, but you can't or I don't want to give anyone that responsibility to solve that problem on an individual level. It needs to be done on a, at a political level. 
education is important as well. That's necessary so people recognize that. But I think if you speak on education, you have to say that people have to be able to understand sources. That is extremely complicated. It's a good thing to teach people, but it's very difficult, especially with images or things generated by AI, media. No one can really see that anymore. But what's important is that people understand mechanisms. Multiplicators, journalists, for instance, often do not understand the mechanisms, how they work. And I think that's what has to be tackled. People have to understand how the internet works and why climate disinformation gets so much traction. Yeah, sorry, Katrin, if I could just add, add a few things there. In terms of what you as individuals can do to break that, that engagement cycle. So sometimes researchers refer to this as the trumpet of amplification, which is a, a nice image to think of, which is the ways that even when we're trying to engage in good faith with content and that we're trying to educate our peer networks or to expose mis and disinformation, sometimes we shine an even greater spotlight onto that content. So there are some really simple things that you can do to make sure both that you know the algorithm doesn't believe that you're part of this cycle, but also to be really careful in the way that you frame things. The first is don't share, as in retweet or repost something in order to debunk it screenshot it because otherwise you are immediately channeling people to the worst offending original content and all you do is provide kind of greater oxygen for it and then the second is we uh, sometimes talk about the truth sandwich which is if you're going to try and fact check something always put the fact at the top the misinformation in the middle and then emphasize the, the verified content at the end. So quite often you will see mainstream media making this mistake where they're trying to debunk a conspiracy theory and they put the conspiracy theory in the headline of the article. But 99% of people these days, unfortunately, don't read the main body of the article. So all you've done is make millions more people more aware of a conspiracy theory without giving them the details on why it is unsubstantiated or false. So it's really important that what you do is you start out with, here is the information and here are the sources that I've used to back up that information. In the middle, you can then say, here are some of the misunderstandings around this topic and the ways that it's being presented and the reasons why that is inaccurate. And then you make sure that people leave again with the factual content by re-emphasizing what are the main takeaways? What is the thing that they should be following? So that's some, you know, part of what you can do in trying to help educate people in your own environment, you know, the people who follow you, your friends, your family, your colleagues. But I would also say that when you are engaging with a post, and this applies to all of us, you know, every single person on this call could fall for a conspiracy theory or a piece of misinformation. It is not to do with some people being uniquely gullible or vulnerable to bad content. You know, all of this content is trying to prey on our emotions and our biases, as I said at the, at the beginning of the call. So there is also a responsibility for all of us to introduce friction into the way that we use social media. And what I mean by that is pausing before we act on any piece of content and action doesn't just mean commenting on it or liking it or sharing it in a group chat action also means you know pursuing that topic further um visiting the website that that that, that posted that uh, that piece of content um privately discussing it offline right we are so used to having these knee-jerk responses to everything that we see and that our reactions have to be spontaneous and immediate. And actually the entire information ecosystem would really benefit from people introducing a forced pause. So if you see a piece of content and it makes you feel a strong emotion in any direction, joy, anger, you know, infuriation, um, whatever it might be is, pause and reflect on the fact that you felt that emotion and give yourself a five to 10 minute window before you do anything in response to it. I also introduced for myself a kind of personal rule um, a year or two ago, which was really difficult, but has made quite a big difference, which was that I could not share an article unless I had read top to bottom what that article contained. Doesn't matter if I thought it looked interesting, doesn't matter if I thought that the person I was sharing it with might want to read it, 
I had to know what the piece of content contained before I was part of the problem in circulating it. So there are some of these like quite simple forms of, of digital and information literacy that I think would really lower the temperature and the fact that we are all basically moving too quickly and that, that is causing all of us to make mistakes, whether they are conscious mistakes or whether they are deliberate ways to spread mis and disinformation. Thanks ever so much, Jenny. I've got, I've learned a lot uh, also for my private media consumption. And of course, not only me, another question in the chat that is generative AI, chat GPT and other tools. What are the impact, uh, impacts on climate uh, disinformation a question to alexandra but also to the other two narratives you've touched upon and maybe you can elaborate this a bit more i might start but of course jenny has a lot more information on uh, gen ai generated information the other two narratives is the theory of the big exchange, the right uh, extreme conspiracy theory, the big exchange of populations, the white population is exchanged by Muslim or other POC or refugees, completely irrational migration debate, which we have a lot in Germany right now. And the second narrative is anti-feminism and uh, the battle against the queer people we can see it in germany with the self-determination act the debate we had there last week and also globally in the us uh in half of us states you cannot legally abort anymore the abortion debate these are very successful strategies and now the focus is not so much anymore on climate change, but uh, regarding AI generated disinformation, I don't have much empirical information. It's quite dangerous because, of course, you can generate very quickly in a big volume with AI this disinformation. It's a big hazard. You don't need any troll plants anymore in Eastern Europe or Russia. Everybody can do it at home now, so there's a big hazard potential. I also know the European Commission exerts a lot of pressure on social media right now when it comes to uh, AI-generated disinformation and to stop it. But in the AI Act, which is now being negotiated and might be put in force next year, there's only... Um, the duty to market as such as AI generated information, but most people don't even see it because the image still speaks to us in our brain. Even if uh, in small size, in small letters, you see it's, G uh, it's AI generated. I can do any final evaluation. Maybe you can stop it because the social media do not want that they are overloaded with AI generated content. But some years ago we had this Facebook theories to react with AI generated counter arguments against hate speech, which I found really a bit pervert, perverted, but maybe Jenny does have any more insights uh, in terms of I, AI generated content. What I would say about AI in general is that the way that it's talked about as a threat it sort of imagines that it's going to create an entirely new universe. Whereas what I see is that it will compound or turbocharge the harms that already exist. So the easier way to think about it is that it lowers the barrier to entry for people who want to do bad, bad activity online, right? So it's not like you couldn't create a form of synthetic media now without AI. Right? But you might need a certain level of technical literacy, you might need access to specific types of tools, and therefore, you know, the number of people in theory who can engage in that sort of behavior is smaller. But even then, I, I would say that it's become massively decentralized and democratized since 
2016, when what we understood about this world was that it was, you know, shadowy groups operating um, next to the Kremlin that were kind of perpetrating coordinated information campaigns. That really isn't the reality of where we're at in 2023. The vast majority of people, including everyone on this call, could probably create a viral disinformation campaign today, even without the use of chat GPT. But the question is, can you do things faster and more at scale? And that's what generative AI enables, is that you could go onto that site and say, OK, um, we have a conspiracy regarding the World Economic Forum and climate change. What we want is a thousand different versions of a similar post that all make those claims, but that are framed towards Gen Z audiences, people who believe in, you know, like what wellness uh, and and are engaged in the kind of yoga community, people who come from far right groups um, and people who are engaged in gaming in gaming platforms and that the generative AI would be able to sort of tailor that messaging and churn out content so that you could then immediately share it and astroturf flood the zone with that kind of content. That's where I see the biggest area of risk. At the moment, AI is mostly being used not to create kind of false claims or, or um, you know, images of things that never happened, but you, but actually to create these like very obviously AI generated emotional graphic images that support conspiracy theories. So they don't look real. You'll have like an animation of a whale jumping over a wind turbine and, you know, bleeding in the process because renewable energy is bad for, for marine wildlife, an entirely false claim, right? But the AI is just being used to provide kind of color and more emotional resonance to a post that could have existed otherwise. Um, I also think, you know, there have been ex some examples, and, and this is really concerning to me, about how it will um, how it will further fuel mistrust in institutions by creating videos where people seem to be saying things that never happened. So sort of audio manipulation and spoofing and visual manipulation and spoofing. There was one example really recently where... Um, which showed a supposed interview between Greta Thunberg on um, British breakfast television. And it was an interview, like a video interview, that seemed to claim she was saying that Hamas and Israel should use eco-friendly bombs in the conflict in the Middle East. And that she was encouraging, you know, weapons manufacturers to create um, forms of, of defense technology that complied with net zero. This was an entirely synthetic interview that went viral on social media and that used these very easily available tools to take the audio of her voice that existed and to create a false interview off the back of it. So that's where I see the danger in, in AI is that because those kind of videos exist, that you just weaken trust in information as a whole because people have no way to decipher what is real and what is not real. You can both, you can claim things that are AI when they're not. You can also claim things that are AI are real. And so you just end up with an entire breakdown of reality and of people's ability to sift through verif verifiable information and non-verifiable information. Yes, thank you. Jen, considering the time left, it's 2 to 4 o'clock. I have to close our chat. There are still two or three questions there, but you can send us the questions via email. I want to thank our speakers for their time, our viewers, and also that uh, put forward a lot of interesting questions. And for us, the organizers, it was nice to see. And thanks to our wonderful team, Anna and Joanne, from the office in Brussels for the technology, but also for our technical support and our interpreters. And I hope, I wish you a wonderful day still, and hope to see you again in our next two events which will be moderated by my wonderful colleagues. And I'm looking forward to having Alexandra again here next time. And with those words, I want to draw a close. Thank you very much.